We conducted an audience research questionnaire before starting the construction of our product, which allowed us to form a better idea of what they would like and implement their recommendations early in the process. We each distributed our questionnaires to 10 different people, making an overall sample of 30 people. As each of us returned with very similar results, we were able to easily incorporate each of our findings without challenging the results of another. We will each be talking about our individual results. The first question on our questionnaire asked which subgenre of horror our audience most preferred. Of the six subgenres to choose from, the most popular was Stalker at 30%, with Paranormal and Torture Porn following with 20% each. This helped us when coming up with the idea for a horror movie, as we knew that the Stalker genre film would be most popular. We therefore ensured that we used this. We also used some elements of the paranormal subgenre, one of the next most popular, by having Santa be the main villain. Santa is revealed to be Flora's mother in disguise by the end of the film, and as such it is clear how the paranormal subgenre has been vastly less used, in accordance with the response my audience research gave us. From our questionnaire, we found that 30% wanted our trailer to be set in a suburban house, which we've incorporated into our trailer. The main part of the trailer takes place in the protagonist, Alex's home. Have Merry Christmas! Thank you. A merry little Christmas Let your heart be light, light. From now oh, on Alex. Our troubles will be teacher, out of really. sight It's not what you think! The setting that was most popular of 40% was the woods during the trailer, the shots in the woods is where the threat in the trailer reaches its height, as it is a chase scene. Using the woods also relates our trailer to the subgenre urban oil, because the threat is in a rural area, and this is the only place in the trailer where death is implied. From our audience feedback from the first draft of our trailer, we found that one of the main points of improvement was to add non-diegetic sound. As our trailer was incomplete, we had not decided what music to add, but we wanted to choose a soundtrack which would create the effect of uneasiness. When doing our research and planning, we found from the questionnaire that most people wanted slow and eerie music, and to create this effect, we decided to use Christmas music, because it connects to our narrative, and having typically happy music over a horror trailer creates a sense of unease. The questionnaire also told us that people wanted jumpy music, so we added non diegetic thuds over the jump cuts. From the results of our questionnaire, we found that the majority of people thought the trailer should begin slow pace and to quicken up at the end of the trailer. This was useful for us because when we incorporated it into our trailer, it helped to create tension and because it is a typical invention used for horror trailers, it helped to establish it as a horror film. When gathering results for our questionnaire on whether the audience wanted a voiceover or not, we found a split result between our group. Becky's results found a 50-50 split between her results, whereas Sarah's results were 80% of the audience said no and 20% said yes. I found that 60% of the audience said no and 40% said yes. Because of these results, we decided not to go the voiceover because we feel it would distract the audience from the narrative of the trailer and would go against the conventions of horror trailers as they tend not to have voiceovers. Also, we feel it would take away the attention from the music in our trailer, which is Christmas music, have which goes with the theme of our trailer, which is a Christmas horror. From this, we have learned having a voiceover does not work with a horror Christmas trailer as it distracts the audience. We've only implied death within our trailer for 12 days because from our questionnaire, I found that it was a 50-50 split between those who wanted to see graphic content and those who didn't. In Tali's results, the majority wanted to see some graphic content, however Sarah found that 50% only wanted to see some. So to appeal to a wider audience, we did not include any deaths in the trailer, but included blood and implied death. So leaving the horror of the film is a mystery that would only be found out when people go and see it. Additionally, this benefits us because if our trailer does not contain much gore, then it will get a lower rating and could be shown before films in the cinema, therefore gaining a larger audience of people wanting to see the film. When asked which transition was best suited to a horror trailer, a cut to black was the most popular response. Although we included this in our trailer, our audience was non-specialist and were therefore not as aware of the, f the effect that cuts to black have. We therefore decided to only use cuts to black at significant points in the trailer, such as this sequence walking up to the tree. We were able to use the transition our audience believed to be the most effective to create an enhanced tension and to show the significance of the sequence and the ch change of tone in the trailer to the faster paced, more intense ending. For the rest of the trailer, we simply use cuts and fades. 
The reason we chose to challenge our audience feedback was that their response contested the conventions of professional media text and would have degraded the professional quality of our trailer. Furthermore, their limited understanding of the effect of different transitions mean that they likely do not realise how much impact simple transitions could make and how they can affect the overall mood of the trailer. An example of this is the start of our trailer, which makes use of fades to exemplify the calmness and harmony of the two friends in the scene, whilst cuts were used during the fast-paced final montage to help show the increasing speed and intensity, thereby increasing the fe fear for the viewer. When deciding what shot types to use in our trailer, we made sure that we took the feedback from our questionnaire into account, whilst remembering that in order for the trailer to be interesting, it should have a variety of shots appropriate to the content, thereby merging our knowledge of professional media text with our audience feedback. A clear example of this is one of the most popular shots in our feedback was the extreme close-up. It would not make sense to have a whole trailer of extreme close-ups and likely very hard to tell a narrative, as well as limiting our use of cinematography and being highly unconventional of any genre of horror movie trailer. Instead, we used extreme close-ups appropriately for things we especially wanted to draw the audience's attention to, such as a dropped key, dripping blood and a male hand coming suddenly out of the snow. Additionally, in my results, my sample did not think any mid or long shots should be used. However, these can be effectively used, such as the long shot in which Alex is walking through her garden towards the hand that jumps out from the snow. By starting with the long shot, we were able to cut to a mid-low angle shot and then an extreme close-up of the hand in the snow. By getting closer with each cut and using cinematography to our advantage, we were able to create in te increasing tension from the use of this long shot to the close-up. Upon reflection, we feel that the options for high and low angle should perhaps have been placed in a separate question, as we now feel that some of the participants may have chosen them because of their connotations and the weight they have, rather than how appropriate they are in the trailer. Another question we asked the audience in our questionnaire was, do you like the use of reviews in trailers? Sarah's results found that the majority of the audience didn't want reviews in the trailer. However, Becky and my results found the majority would like reviews in the trailer. Although the majority of our audience wanted reviews in the trailer, we decided to go against this as we felt that the reviews would distract the audience from the trailer's narrative and also ruin the atmosphere of the trailer. We feel by not including reviews, the audience will be more involved into the trailer and will enjoy it more. Another question asked in our questionnaire was which font do you prefer or which font is best suited for the text in a horror trailer? The audience had a choice of six fonts, which included True Lies, My Bloody Valentine and Friday 13th. All our results said that the majority of our audience preferred the True Lies font. Because of this, we decided to use this font in our trailer as it is a popular choice of the audience and will be more pleasing to the eye. From this, we have learned that only certain fonts work with horror trailers, as other fonts can make it less scary or just ruin the trailer overall. When we showed a target audience our trailer, the feedback received was very helpful. One point made was the trailer was incomplete. This was because we still needed to add in some clips and also had to refilm other clips that we were not happy with. This meant that bits of the trailer were missing and we have to use still images from our storyboard to fill in the gaps. From this we have learned that having an incomplete trailer can be confusing for the audience but also shows us where we need to add in clips and refilm to make the trailer better for everyone. The feedback we got from our first draft highlighted to us how the small amount of dialogue at the beginning of the trailer made the narrative unclear. Have yourself Merry Christmas. a merry little Christmas. Let your heart be light. We attempted to edit the beginning again to see if we were able to make the narrative clearer, but we decided to reshoot this beginning section to contain more dialogue as the trailer would not have such an effect on the audience if the narrative is unclear. It was also suggested that we use fade transitions within our trailer, which we had not yet implemented. This was contrary to the response we received for our audience questionnaire, which had suggested that we would not use fades. We found that by taking the advice of those who had actually seen a first draft of the trailer and therefore had a better idea of what suited our vision, we were able to add to the effect we were trying to create. This is true of the opening sequence, in which we use fades as the transition is smooth and less harsh than either of cut or cut to black. It works in cohesion with the warm colours of the scene to evoke the equilibrium stage of Todorov's narrative as it has a dreamlike, pleasant quality to it. We hence found this response to be one of the most helpful. Also with the feedback of our trailer's first draft, the audience said they enjoyed the shot of the bloodbath. Because I enjoyed this clip, we decided to add in another clip of the bloodbath from another angle to create more suspense and also please the audience as they enjoyed the previous clip of this bloodbath. 
This clip also follows the convention that horror trailers have blood scenes. From this, we have learned that adding scenes that are pleasing to the audience can make the audience want to go watch the film more and also is more pleasing to the eye. Another piece of feedback we received for the first draft of our trailer was that they would like to see blood running down the carving fork to make it clearer that Flora had been killed. We challenged this response as the majority of the audience felt that this was a clear point made in the trailer, even though they hadn't understood why she was killed. Additionally, it aided the enigma of our trailer, Santa's identity. By making Flora's fate somewhat unclear, discovering I Santa's identity becomes harder as you are unsure what they are motivated by. Finally, we had other shots of blood in our trailer that we felt were more effective and maintained the iconography of horror, whilst the blood on the fork would have been more gruesome. By using blood in shots that did not show obvious wounds or victims, the trailer would be more widely accessible to a younger viewership. As we want as large an audience as possible within the horror fan demographic, this is therefore conducive to interacting our target audience. The first question I asked when researching for my poster was who they would like to be on the poster. I found that 50% thought that the antagonist should be on the poster, however I didn't comply to this and decided to listen to the 30% who thought that a prop or location should be used. I decided to have the prop of the present and carving fork on my poster because I believed it made it unique from other posters and also got across clearly the unique selling point of 12 days, so making people want to see it more. I also wanted to know whether or not people thought that the poster should be busy or plain, and I used the examples of Dracula and Scream 4. 90% of people thought that the poster should be minimal, which I incorporated onto my poster by only using a singular image. I also asked how much text people thought should be on the poster, and the majority said minimal. So I used this on my poster by not having any reviews and only the title, tagline, date of release and credits. This is important to find out as I wanted to create a poster that the audience would expect to see and would be associated to the horror genre. The next question which I asked my questionnaire was the type of font to use for my title, and most people chose Lycanthrope. Instead of using this font for my title, instead I used it for my tagline because I wanted to draw people's attention towards the tagline, as it is lyrics from a Christmas song and the combination of horror and Christmas is a unique selling point of 12 days. He sees you when you're sleeping. He knows when you're awake. As I listened to my questionnaire, I was told in my audience feedback that the tagline stood out of the poster should grab the audience's attention, making them want to see the film. From my questionnaire, I found that people thought that my poster should have minimal colour when I asked if the poster should be black and white, have minimal colour or bold colours. I listened to my questionnaire and incorporated this into my poster as this is what people would expect from a poster of the horror genre. So the only colours I used on my poster were red and gold. My questionnaire told me that people preferred the names The Dark and Hammer, and out of the two of them I decided to use The Dark. However, when I received audience feedback on my first draft, a few people told me they did not like the name, so I asked for some suggestions and I selected Haunted House at the options that people told me. Another aspect that I changed when I received audience feedback was the font colour, as originally my headings were black but I was told they didn't stand out that much, so I changed them to white and put in red banners. This shows that audience feedback I got from my first draft of my magazine was important, as it helps to improve my magazine after I had my results from my questionnaire. When I made my first draft of my magazine, I decided not to comply to results I'd got from my questionnaire to have interviews advertised, because I believed that the cover would look too cluttered, and I had been told from my post that people preferred a minimal poster, and I wanted to continue this onto my magazine front cover. Yet when I got my audience feedback from my first draft, people told me there was not enough advertisement on what was featured on the magazine to make them want to buy it. This is important information because it helps to improve my magazine to grab more audience attention. I found from my questionnaire when I asked who they would like to see on the front cover that 40% said they wanted to see the antagonist. However, when I made my magazine, I decided to not have the antagonist on the cover because within the trailer their identity is a mystery and all we find is a note that they have left and signed as Santa. So I wanted to continue this mystery of the antagonist onto my magazine and instead use a protagonist which 30% of people voted for. When creating my horror film poster, I did a lot of research to find out the conventions of a horror poster. I also carried out a questionnaire where I asked my target audience what they would like to see or prefer in a poster. One question I asked was who would the audience like to see on the front cover? 50% of my audience said they preferred the main character on the front cover. Because of this, I have decided to include the main character, Alex, on the front cover as it is pleasing to the audience and tells the audience who will be included in the film. 
Another question I asked my audience is how much space the credit should take up on the poster. The results found that 70% said some, 20% said none, and 10% said a lot. Because of these results, I decided only to use some of the space at the bottom of the poster to include the credits so it doesn't distract the audience from the main image and titles. I also gathered some feedback from my fellow peers on the poster. They said they enjoyed the layout of the poster, therefore I kept the layout in which the poster was in when I first created it. They also enjoyed the font use on the credits, so I kept this in. However, when I first created the poster, I used a different font on the title of 12 Days and the tagline. My peers said that it didn't fit in with the theme of the horror and was hard to see over the main image. Because of this, I decided to change this to make it fit in more with the horror theme, which they agreed looked so much better. From this, I have learned that asking for feedback from your audience and fellow peers on what you have created helps you improve your final product. When creating my horror film magazine front cover, I did a lot of research to find out what the conventions of a horror film magazine front cover are. I also carried out a questionnaire where I asked my target audience what they would like to see or prefer in a horror film magazine front cover. One question I asked was what would the audience like as the main image on the magazine? My results came back with 50% of my audience saying that they would like the main character as the main image on my magazine. Because of this, I've decided to include the main character, Alex, as my main image on my magazine cover, as it is what the audience wants and is more pleasing to the audience's eye. Another question I asked my audience was should the header be in front of the main image or behind? 80% of my audience said behind and 20% said in front. However, I decided to go against what my results said, as on most horror film magazine front covers, the header is in front of the main image. An example of this is on Gore Zone magazine. I also feel it looks better with the header in front and fits in well with the whole style of the magazine front cover. I also gathered some feedback from my fellow peers on my horror film magazine front cover. They said they liked the layout of the magazine, therefore I kept this the same. They also said they liked the effect of the shadow in the background as it creates a creepy and scary effect on the magazine. However, on my first draft, my peers said that they needed to add something to the bottom of the magazine as it looked empty. I took this advice and added a banner with information of what would be included in the magazine. Once added, they agreed that the poster looked a lot better. For my ancillary product, I used a questionnaire to discover what audience liked in addition to conducting secondary research. I found that my audience being non-specialist in their knowledge of movie posters and horror magazines caused some conflict between my primary and secondary research. An example of this is my first question, as the majority of candidates responded that they would not expect to see credits on a horror poster. This may be because they feel as though this poster looks better, even if it is less conventional than any movie poster, not just one of the horror genre. As I found that almost all professional horror posters had credits on them, I went with the second most popular answer of some, as it created a more conventional professional poster, which would therefore appeal to more people. The shot type I used for my poster was influenced both by the response to what my candidates told me they thought was the most appropriate, and the question whether they preferred posters to be busy or plain. The two most popular answers for the appropriate shot type were close-up, with 50% of the votes, and extreme close-up, with 40% of the votes, which I combined with the response of 40% of my audience thought a poster should be somewhat busy. I used two different shots of an eye and of a hand grabbing Santa's hat, the first an extreme close-up and the second a close-up, and used both of them to create a poster that was somewhat busy, as it had two things to attract your attention. By reducing the opacity of the eye, I was able to make it less noticeable, having taken inspiration from the Gone Girl and 28 Days Later poster, which allowed the posters to seem less busy with the arm, Santa's hat, blood and the copy. As 50% of my audience said they did not like reviews on a horror poster, which was evidenced by the lack of reviews on many professional media texts, I did not consider putting them on my poster. However, I did place a From the Makers of Adolescent Anarchy at the top of the page which incites the same faith in the quality of the film and is much more widely seen on posters. 80% of my audience stating that they preferred some colour on horror posters was useful as it worked with the black, red and white colour scheme I had chosen for all three of my media products due to their links to the horror genre and the link of red and white to my Christmas subgenre. 
Furthermore, by knowing that my audience recommended I stick to a few colours, I was able to more confidently make the decision to fade the eye into the background of the poster, as it removed the blue colour of the eye and helped draw your attention to the focus of the image. On the other hand, I was also told through verbal feedback that without prior knowledge that the eye was there, it was relatively unnoticeable. This led me to brightening the eye in between my first and second draft. All of my candidates said they wanted some cover lines on a magazine cover, which made it easy for me to find horror magazines to draw inspiration from. However, the responses to the 17th question were more contentious, as when I began the construction of my magazine, I found that I had decided on using a black, red and white colour scheme to unite my promotion package and enforce the Christmas horror crossover genre. This challenged the response my audience had given. In order to compromise, as the feedback was intended to show me what audiences would buy, which is the purpose of a promotion package, I added yellow to the colour scheme of my magazine cover. I chose the title Fear for my magazine, as this was confirmed to be the most popular through both the questionnaire and verbal feedback from my peers. I was also influenced by verbal feedback to make the setting of my main image the woods, rather than the graveyard, as I was told it made more sense with the narrative of the trailer, which has shots from the same woodland. Finally, I asked my audience what horror iconography they would expect to see on a horror magazine. The even division of symbols of death and gore, in addition to the ignorance of weapons, speaks to the fact that little of my audience were horror enthusiasts or that they had ever encountered horror magazines before. Additionally, I found it hard to take pictures of symbols of death, for instance it was hard for me to access a graveyard, purchase a Grim Reaper costume and organise a separate photo shoot, or to find bats or skulls. It was therefore far more practical for me to take pictures of weapons for the image in the bottom left corner and to add gore using a blood splatter paintbrush in Photoshop. Whilst this meant I betrayed my audience feedback, I still conformed to the conventions of professional media texts, and as such, this creative decision had little impact on my cover.